professors will bear with me on that. But what I really want to talk about is what I've committed my certainly last 15 years to, and that's living and operating at the intersection of innovation, leadership, uh, and sustainability. And, and at the outset, I think about sustainability as making sure we use resources to meet today's needs, but ensuring that we're good stewards of those resources and the environment so that future generations, and that's every future generation, can also have the same chance at a peaceful, healthy, happy life that we have. So that's kind of the worldview, and I come at it through what can I do as a leader, what can I do as an innovator to make that, make that uh, happen. So for the students, some questions you might be pondering. I know we're just talking to one of my Navy colleagues here. You come to business school. How many of you are, 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 are business school students? Other folks sort of outside that are undergrads? We have undergrads? Other graduate school students, yes? OK. So what everybody's, you know, we're all trying to figure out what do we want to do with our life. So especially those of you that are in school here, especially you that are in the SOM, you're probably pondering some questions. Do I, do I want to be the boss or do I want to work for somebody else? Do I want to work at a big company uh, or do I want to be an innovator? I want to focus on innovation. Do I want to work internationally and be a global player or do I want to be more domestic focused? Do I want to make lots of money or do I want to make a difference in the world? You want to be great at something or do you want to find work-life home balance? Do you want to do important work or do you want to have fun? Do you want to get out there into the world and work or do you want to stay and continue studying? So those are some questions you might be pondering. So we're going to come back to these at the end and I have a point of view on these and some of you might already have a sense if these are even the right questions to be asking yourself. But let's talk a little bit about the world that you're all going to go out into when you do graduate, in the world that the, the rest of you are, how many, we have professors as well? I know my friend many. Others that, what brings you here today, sir? Well, I've got a background in economics and sociology, and I'm interested in the diffusion of renewable energy. Great, great. Um, so all of us, it, whether, we're, whether we're students, whether we're working, whether we're academics, are, are operating in this world of a growing population. So UN estimates that by 2025 uh, and, and to, through 2035, we're going to end up with about 9 billion people uh, on the planet. And by the end of the century, when we're thinking about sustainability, we've got to think long term. We've got to think in terms of centuries, not years or even decades, but centuries. There's going to be 11 billion people on the planet. So right now, we have the leaders of about 200 countries that are meeting in Paris for the Climate Accord, COP21, and they're talking about this issue, which is greenhouse gas emissions. How much can we emit? How much greenhouse gas can the planet absorb and, and not be on a perilous path? But we're, we're on a perilous path, and the question is, can we slow it and can we reverse it? Climate change, global warming is a big issue. This is the two degree number. We've got to keep that climate change, that global warming under two degrees, because that has massive impacts on land mass, the oceans, the air mass. And two big problems that come out of that. First is that we start to see sea level rise. That's happening around the world and we're seeing it being accelerated in certain parts of the world. Second, you see statistically significant increases in severe weather events. That's happening here in the US, happening around the world. There is debate in certain circles about whether human activity, fossil fuels, all of the things we're doing on the planet Earth with seven, eight, going to nine to 11 billion people has any role in the, the warming and any role in severe weather, I think the data would suggest that it does. And even if it doesn't, getting out in front of it makes quite good sense. And of course, as the CEO of a water technology company, Oasis Water, I want to come back and talk a little bit later about Oasis, about the transition from Oasis out of Yale and, and moving it through a startup into a growth phase and also about life as a CEO. So I'll come back to that in the last phase of the conversation. But for this purpose, I'd be remiss if I didn't also point out that the US and the world is facing an acute water shortage. Uh, today, very significant, expected to extend to be about a 40% shortfall in the next 10 to 15 years. So that's a big deal. Less than 1% of the world's water is fresh and accessible. So water is a big deal. So no surprise at the World Economic Forum. By the way, you, you left out that we're also a World Economic Forum technology pioneer. So that was one of our good awards. That just means we get to go to Davos. But unfortunately, awards don't turn into revenue. So my board likes all that, but they really want us to sell projects. Uh, 
So no surprise that these facts and factors are tied into the way that the World Economic Forum thinks about the world. And they're looking at the future and saying, what are the issues that are going to disrupt economic growth? What are the issues that are going to create instability? Chief among it is, is water. And what's interesting about water is it's now the number one global risk. And it used to be a environmental risk. It was considered an environmental problem. Now it's considered a societal problem because it's so interconnected with everything else. The problem with these, these different fact and factors that come together, the issue is not that we're going to get replaced by some new breed of dinosaur, right? And we're going to get kicked off the planet anytime soon. And the issue is not that we're going to wake up one day and that we're going to be in the Kevin Costner aqua world where it's all going to be covered by water. The issue is that these things are going to come together and create massive instabilities. You're going to get instability around the world. We're already seeing it. You're going to start to get more resource scarcity. And when, when resources get scarce, people try to hoard them. Communities and countries and people become more insular. And you end up with more suffering. Those are the issues that we've got to worry about. Not the dinosaurs, not the flooding um, of the whole planet. We've got to worry about these instability issues. So we're already seeing it. So ISIS, terrorism. I spent the first half of my life as an uh, active military officer you know, all around the world. We just started to see the onset of something we didn't quite understand called Al-Qaeda. Right now, Al-Qaeda looks mild as compared to ISIS. But terrorism sort of fosters an instability, dislocation, and suffering. This is a map of refugee movements. So all of the dialogue here in the US now about Syrian, Iraq, and Iraqi refugees, how do we deal with them? It's happening all over the world. But what's happening today is a harbinger of what we might see in the future, where tens and even hundreds of millions of people need to find new places to pursue health and happiness. So this is a real deal. And the history books are replete with wars being fought over uh, resource scarcity and, and, and instabilities. So this is the balance, right? So how do we, how do we turn the scales in, in the direction of stability and abundance, prosperity? Because that's the world that we want to live in. That's the world we want our children to live in. And that's the world we want to turn over to future generations. That's the world we're going to see growth. And we're going to have good things where human potential is going to be realized. But it's a balance. We've got to, we've got to find that balance. So um, last night, I was at a sustainability salon. It was done in a TEDx format. I don't know how many folks have been to a TED or a TEDx. You have these very packaged, sort of 18, no longer than 18 minute talks. And it was really nice because it was all focused on sustainability. And I was one of three speakers. The first speaker was uh, Larry Seltzer, who runs conservation funds. So what they do is they go buy up land and put it into conservation. And what he talked about was convergence, the convergence of activity in the nonprofit world and best practices from the business world. And how do you merge those? How do you think differently about the way that nonprofits should work? In particular, how does he think about nonprofits in the, in, in the conservation and environmental and sustainability sector? He talked about the first generation of conservation really being the Teddy Roosevelt era, about 100, 110 years ago when he was president. He started the national park, started to buy up land. Great. Second was the Rachel Carson era, 60s, 70s, uh, um, with Silent Spring, and, and that brought in more activism and more regulation. But it was about saying no to stuff. Um, he, he proposed that the convergence of where business is about saying yes, especially startups, about taking risks and moving forward. So he talked about how do we get business and nonprofits to work together toward a more sustainable future. Really nice, nice talk. The other talk was by my friend Karina Funk, who's one of the leading investors uh, at the intersection of sustainability and business. They do mostly public company investing, very good track record. And she talked about the false choice between investing for impact and investing for returns. And she showed some data and had some case studies. But they've had a very successful track record in looking deeply at companies that are thinking about sustainability, not necessarily and only about providing sustainable products, but the way that these companies manage their supply chains, manage their customer relationships, their, their product, energy, wa and water footprint. And so she made a really nice case study uh, and, a, and, a, and a case for the fact that it's a false choice, that you can have both. And, 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 and that's where we need to move to both as business folks, as academics, and as investors to look for and reward those companies that are uh, operating at those intersections. Those are two great talks. Um, I gave a talk that was quite a bit different. And, and the, the talk I gave was, how do we have to tackle the sustainability challenge? And I'm just going to share just a few highlights, or maybe lowlights, depending on what you think of it. Um, so a lot of times in the world of sustainability, 
people invoke the moonshot. When President Kennedy sat in 62 um, at Rice University, another lesser but great university, um, he challenged Americans to put a man on the moon by the end of that decade. And he said, we've got to be courageous in our thinking, we've got to be creative in our invention and make stuff that didn't exist to get there and back, by the way, which is an important part for the astronauts. Uh, and then uh, third, importantly, you've got to commit. Time, energy, resources, the national psyche. Right? And, and, and so a lot of times that's the thing that we invoke. We've got to do a moonshot to get you know, with clean tech companies. And I suggested that that's a great metaphor, but insufficient, because it's a, a technical challenge, but, but not as, as, as deep a technical challenge as we face in creating renewable energy and fresh water. These are real issues you're up against the law of thermodynamics in many cases. And only Manny's the only guy that I know that can break the laws of thermodynamics. No one else has done it. Does everybody know many, Professor Elamelik? So it's out of his lab that Oasis uh, technology was originally conceived. So he and I are going to, uh, yeah, he and I are going to be uh, chatting a little bit later. So it's tough. And the other issue is that this was a single nation problem. This was mo mobilizing America for seven years for the, today's tune about $100 billion. Um, the, the sustainability challenge is a multinational challenge. So everybody's coming to Paris with their own issues, right? Their own agendas, their own political realities. Um, and it's not a $100 billion challenge. It's a, tr it's a trillion dollar a year challenge for the next 10, 20, 30 years. So it's a big deal. So I said that's, that's maybe the wrong way to think about it. And, and I sort of harken back as a military guy. I said, we need a battle plan. So we need to treat this like a global war. Not a global war on terror, but a global war for sustainability. And of course, I couldn't help but show pictures of an aircraft carrier. I was a fighter pilot in my earlier life. So I spent about 15 years active duty, and I spent a good four of those years on, on ships like this flying off. And the whole point was that the aircraft carrier is the most formidable weapon system platform ever devised. In, in, it, literally in a matter of days, it can be anywhere in the world, and it can be applying a dizzying array of, of capabilities. Even, sorry, more to my submarine brother in here. Um, who probably could sink this if he wanted to, but we'll, we'll leave that out. We'll, we'll leave that out for the moment. Um, but this, th this didn't happen. It didn't just become this, right? Um, it, it, it started like this. So this is the first aircraft carrier takeoff. This was in 1910. Some crazy stunt pilot named Eugene Eli took off of the USS Birmingham out in Hampton Roads, Virginia on November 14, 1910. And, and it, it took him two months to, to figure out how to land on it. So he, two months later, he was the first guy to land on a ship, too, which is, I can promise you, is a lot harder than taking off, um, but especially at night. Um, but we started here, and a, a hundred years later, hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars, literally, invested with a national commitment to the importance of this resource for peace and prosperity around the world, we end up with this, right? So this is what I used to fly. I mean, is this an awesome machine? Lots of capabilities, not only for combat, but for for peacekeeping missions, for supporting people after, after big uh, uh, you know, Katrina-like incidents, right? And, and I talked to them also about that the ship and the technology is great, but it really is about the people. It's, you know, it's these young men and women who work on the flight deck or have their own jobs to do, but work together towards that common mission. And, and the Navy, we, we sometimes laugh that the, the military or the Navy is 250 years of tradition unhampered by progress. Um, but, but there's a ton of progress, a lot of evolution of strategy and tactics. Um, we got leaders, uh, like my friend here who was the CEO of the Abraham Lincoln, um, and, and these folks are exceptional leaders who committed their whole life to doing this. And so my argument was, if we're fighting a global war for sustainability, we better put the, the effort behind it. We've got to treat it like it's a military exercise, but not fighting you know, a, a war against others, uh, not a war that's, that's a win by destruction, but it's a war that's won by construction, by building a new future, by building renewable cities, by building new ways of transportation, new ways to produce energy, new ways to store energy, new ways to grow food sustainably, healthy food. Um, and it was also, I argued that it wasn't about country against country, army against army, and people against people. It was about how do we bring men and women from different countries, different backgrounds together to solve the common problem. Uh, and, and, and ultimately, I had this notion of a global sustainability core, right? So we need a global sustainability core, a multinational organization that would bring together and work alongside the military, not replace the military, work maybe with the UN, bring this capability because of this multinational commitment together. 
So I had a bunch of people sign up. So we now have 12 people in the Global Sustainability course. We're on our way to a goal of 10,000 people. So we'll talk more about that. But that, that was the TED Talk. So it was interesting because it talked about the nonprofit world and convergence of best practices. It talked about investment that's a false choice between making returns and, uh, and, and, and having an impact. And I talked about different models. So it's really TED Talks are generally about where do you find these things at the intersection. But we thought it was interesting. I wanted to share that with you. Um, any questions on that so far? And then I'm going to spend a little bit of time just talking quickly about uh, Oasis and, and a little bit about sort of leadership in the startup setting. We good on time? No questions? I was told that Yaleys are very curious, inquisitive folk. Don't let me down. <laughs> OK. So Oasis. Uh, our motto is think forward. It's, our, it's our, one of our five values. Um, we think about it in terms of you know, looking, looking to the future, being innovative. But it's also, of course, a tagline where our technology is based on a notion called forward osmosis. It's a new way to use a membrane. Uh, essentially operating a membrane at very low pressure. And I'm not going to get into technology. That's as deep as I'm going to go, because I, Manny will correct me if I say anything else. Um, so let's go back to the global risk. So water water's the number one global risk. I talked about it already. It's trans, translated from being a societal risk to, a, uh, to now a, 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 for an environmental to a societal risk. Do I have a little gadget here? There you go. So there it is, top right. So a lot of smart people think water is the biggest issue facing the planet. And what's interesting is this is another way to look at it. This is today. It says it's going to be a big problem in 18 months. And of all the big problems, it's the one that people think is going to get worse before it gets better. So in 10 years, people think water is going to be the biggest problem. They already think it's the biggest problem. And even more people think it's going to be a big problem in 10 years. So this is a problem we've got to, we've got to focus on. We've got to solve. And unlike climate change, water, water is a global problem, but it's solved very locally. You don't solve climate change locally. You gotta, every little power plant's got to do its bit. But if everybody doesn't do its part, you don't solve the problem. Water is interesting because you can solve it locally. And then you have these water scarcity regions. Essentially, as you move to industrialization in all these different regions, you put more and more pressure on that, that scarce 1% resource. And I already highlighted the fact we're going to have a 35 40% shortfall. And so Oasis, Oasis is very mission driven. We're a for-profit organization, so we believe that we can generate returns for our investors and our employees uh, and our shareholders, but also do good. So we talk about being an important and a valuable company. That's our mission. People say, what's the mission? What's our goal? We want to be valuable, financially valuable, so that we can earn more resources to do more good work. But we want to do important work, too. So we want to be mission focused. We want to be proud of how we do what we do. But we're focused on the water problem. And in particular, uh, we're focused on the issue of industrial wastewater. So a lot of folks, and many, a lot of his background, especially come from Israel, people talk about seawater desalination. So how do you take ocean water and turn that into fresh water? Big challenge. A um, lot of good work over the last 30, 40, 50 years has been done on that. And reverse osmosis, it's a membrane-based system as well, has come down a very nice cost curve up a performance curve. And there's pretty reasonable economics and energy consumption metrics around how you turn seawater into fresh water. We're focused on, uh, on a different and adjacent problem. We're focused on what we call abused waters, abused industrial waters. So these waters are much more complex than seawater. A lot of times more, more dissolved solids, and not just sodium chloride, but minerals, organic, silicates. So really it's complex waters. And these are waters associated with a lot of industrial activity around the world. Um, it, it, a lot of, you, you may hear stats for those of you in the water world that 70% of the water in the world is used for agricultural purposes. It's true if you're in an agricultural region, but if you're in an industrialized location like China, like India, where we're operating in both those places, here in North America, the vast majority of water is used for industrial purposes. And a big chunk of that is used for power, thermal cooling, flue gas desulfurization. So there's a deep interconnect between water, water usage, and energy, and agriculture, by the way. So our whole goal as a, as a, as a company is to bring new technology that offers significant value proposition to the customer. So all this talk about sustainability and being green and doing good, that's all, that's all great. But if we can't deliver technology that works, that's valuable to the customer, doesn't matter. We don't change the game if we don't deliver value to the end customer. So I'll talk quickly about so where we've been, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about where we're, where we're going. So of course, all good things start at Yale. 
Um, research probably, what, many in 05, 06, 07, that time frame, right? With Rob and you work at Manny's had his whole, a lot of his life dedicated to the idea of Ford osmosis. Yeah, um, I, I, I was at that time a, a managing partner at a venture capital firm in Boston leading the sustainable technology efforts. And, and I had thought a lot about water and we were looking for something breakthrough. Came across one of uh, Manny's uh, students, Manny, and long story short, we got a company started, did the initial financing in 2009. And essentially the first three, four years uh, with that initial financing were all about, you have a question? Yes, great. Hey, make sure you touch, uh, press the button because we're recording. Thanks. Uh, I was just wondering where exactly the company was, like technologically, when you made your Series A investment? Like what had been done up to now, up to then? Um, so there was a small pilot scale system, uh, maybe a cubic meter a day. Um, the so the the system has different components. It has a membrane. It has a draw system that creates that movement across the membrane and then has a recovery step to recycle that. So there's kind of three big systems, subsystems we need to work on. The membrane was, wasn't there. I mean, we had, there was some concept of a membrane. That's been a huge area of development. Um, the draw solution uh, was understood, I think probably best of all. A lot of work's been done there as well. And there's been a little bit of work done on this on this recovery, and, and honestly, even the last, many and I were talking, the last six months, we've learned a bunch. So, so from an IP standpoint, there were two pieces of IP that we licensed from Yale, and Yale's been a great partner. We now have hundreds of patents, patents pending across 38 families, so it's a, you know, been a big ex extension with many's help here uh, at Yale. There were a couple of folks uh, in the company that were thinking about it, a technologist and a business person. It was very early. So, We've done a lot of company creation where you go in and work with a professor and start a company. I've also invested in companies that were more full formed. This was on the, this was like a early seed stage, to put it in that context, depending on how you look at it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So the first, the first thing I do is, is translate the science into engineering and then engineering into product. And that takes time. It takes the right people. It, it takes not just scientists, it takes engineers. It also takes interaction with the market to know what problem you're solving. And so that first, Really, three years, uh, four years was focused on that. And what's interesting is when the company was first founded, the vision was, could it disrupt seawater desalination? And we had a lot, we've had lots of heated debates about this. Short version is, FO, at least the way we're doing it, is better suited to these abused industrial waters than seawater desalination. And, and I think we've gotten clear, and I think that the academic and, and, and now the industry is getting clear, but we were kind of bouncing around trying to find our value proposition. And that's very common for a technology-led company. You got this cool technology. It's gonna solve some problem. Where is that problem? And this intersection between the, the problem and the technology, especially in sustainability where the economics are so tight. And then we got into what, where I got involved, and, 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 and there's not more stuff here because I was involved here, but because we went from an R&D organization to a commercial organization where we are today, 15 going to 16, and this was what I call the becoming commercial phase. And that's a big phase. You first gotta figure out what you're doing, you then gotta go sell somebody to work with you, and then you gotta build what you sold them, and, and then you gotta make it all work, right? And that's what we've been doing for the last couple of years. We've built systems in China, here in the US, big learning phase, not just technically, but organizationally. How do we get, not just the technologists, we gotta get salespeople, we gotta get supply chain, we gotta manufacture stuff. So you go through all that phase, and we've taken an approach with partners in China and in oil and gas. So you gotta you know, get great partners alongside you. Huge believer that, that, that the path to success and scale in the sustainability sector is through young innovative companies and, and big incumbents that can work and bring the best of those two organizations together. Very similar to the biotech model, whole separate conversation. Um, and these are some of the nice awards and recognition that Michael mentioned. Um, that we got, and that was important because those things early in the company's life cycle bring credibility to the company, um, and, and it, it really, really matters. So that's where we've been now, literally with a shockingly one month left in 2015, we're planning for the future, planning for 16 and beyond. Um, so where do we wanna go? So we are, we are at, we're growing a global enterprise. So you gotta take that R&D company to becoming commercial. Now we're decidedly commercial. We're talking to the company about 
on a day-to-day -day basis is how do we scale? How do we do the things we need to do to really grow? And all this describes all the stuff we want to do with the technology. So there's a whole bunch yet to do to de-risk and improve and extend the technology footprint. But we also have a whole bunch to do on the commercial side. And, and, and all those two got to go hand in hand. And you got to make decisions about where you're going to invest your resources on the commercial, on the technical. And, and you got to make, you got to make real tough decisions. And you got to deliver value and you got to become profitable. First got to become gross margin focused. And it sounds like a, a, a banal thing to talk about. Gross margin, who cares? I mean, the, the success to business in my life, or my view, is gross margin. And, and you probably don't think about it enough, but if you got gross margin, life is good. If you don't have gross margin, it's tough to grow business. So especially in, in something where you're manufacturing a good or a service, you've got to really think about that gross margin. So we're also, the other thing we're trying to do is we're trying to grow globally. So it's all about partners. So we're operating in China. India, the Middle East, we got an operation in, in, in Australia and here in North America. So we got five continents, we got 60 people. So it's, we're constantly trying to find out how do we get leverage through partners, through understanding what's happening, through localizing in China and India. And there's a whole separate dialogue about how you operate internationally, but you, there's no such thing as, as being a domestic only company. And then we've got to understand customers in different segments. So the future for us in 16 and 17 is to continue to grow expand that gross margin and start to show that we can become profitable. Technology is great, people are very excited, it's a big problem, it's the number one problem in the world, but if we can't show that not only are we important but also valuable, it doesn't matter. So we've got to focus on that intersection that Karina talked about, about the sustainable delivery of performance and also return on investments. So that's really where we're, where we're focused. Questions on that? And we have one more segment. Yes, ma'am. The idea of abused or spent industrial water seems like a really big catch-all to me when you think about yes. like, what's coming out of a dairy plant being really different than what's coming out of a cooling tower yes. with the chemicals there. I mean, how do you balance between making a one-size-fits-all option that for you guys you can sell to many people quickly versus personalizing it to a particular industry? The fundamental question, fundamental. I, I, we were saying earlier, I think at lunch, it, you know, it was on the board you know, it would, it would, I would ask that question because it was all about market segmentation. So you look, water is a $600 billion a year industry. That includes bottled water, pipes and pumps. Equipment's a $40 billion a year industry. Um, and, and so, you know, keep zeroing it down. Where can we access the customer? And it, the industrial equipment we want to sell for these difficult waters is maybe a $2 billion a year. But even then, that's too big. So which subsegment? So we went at it and said, Geographies matter because context, context matters. Application matters. Beverage is different than power is different. Upstream oil and gas, unconventional, conventional are different. So all these things are different. So we've done our homework through good product marketing, product management, R&D interface to understand which of those boxes make sense, which are good fits for our technology, which regions, which countries have drivers that people need to or are willing to invest in new technologies, what are the economics, and sequencing those and saying no to most things. So when I first, when I first came in full time as the CEO, literally within two weeks, the first thing we said was, we literally just, uh, this is a metaphorical box, but we basically I said, everything outside of this stuff is out. And I said, in a month, we're gonna come back and we're gonna draw a smaller box. And there was a lot of stuff that was all over the map. So we said, we're gonna do this, and then we eventually said, we're gonna do China, and we're gonna do the US and oil and gas, and we're gonna figure it out. So we did that for 18 months, and you had to learn the technology, figure out what was repeatable, what was bespoke. But it's a big issue, and because it, it's about, it's about the, the, and I was gonna say on the board, I would always ask like, what's our market segment, what's our economics, and the answer was always, well, it depends. And it drove me crazy, and now when people ask me, like, well, what's the economics, what do you do? Well, it depends. Depends on the water, how big, where is it, what's the energy? And it is, and it's one of the really big challenges of an industrial technology, but especially water. Because every water is different, Every context is different, regulations are different, and it's why very few water companies get to scale. Very few. Seawater desalination, there's differences, but not that many. In, industrial water is massively different. And it's, it's a challenge and an opportunity for us, for sure. The nice thing is that FO and the way we've manifest it is pretty flexible, pretty robust, but there's still a bunch we've got to do to improve it and to think about not just new membranes, but new membrane architectures, new ways to do the recovery. So there's, the nice thing is there's a huge product development roadmap ahead, but we gotta earn the right to get there. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. So your target client, is it going to be yourself, or 
you got to hold something down there. Sorry. Who's your target? Imagine you're at the UN. I, there you go. Um, I'm curious who your target client is, um, mm -hmm. industry itself, municipalities. We're focusing on the industrial customer. We're not focused on ag, not municipal. Over time, maybe the value chains intersect and there's things we could do in municipal, but we're focused on the industrial customer. Um, again, to that matrix, we're focused on industrial customers in China and India. More narrowly, in China, we go to especially the state-owned enterprises who, who own and operate power plants. So they have a water problem. And there's regulations that they have to go to zero liquid discharge, so they have to treat that water. So with our partner, we go and we work a process to get in front of the owners of the power plants and the operators of those power plants. In India, for example, we go to textile mill owners. We're working with them. We're going to large, you know, large, some large food and beverage processors who need to, who need to treat their water. So we, we, we deliver value to the end industrial customer. Now, we can do it, we do it with partners, and we also can do it either in delivering them equipment, saying, here you go, we're gonna build you something, it's all yours, you operate it. But there's also new models of build on operate models where with our partner, essentially what we do is we build it, we figure out how to finance it, and we own and operate it on behalf of the customer so they don't have to pay for it. They, they pay us a tolling fee. So we're thinking create, creatively about business models as well. Okay? Yes, ma'am. What, what are you treating the water to? Like a drinking water? I mean, the point is to recycle. Is that the point? Like you're creating Correct. water that can be reused. Yes, yes. That's why you're saving water. It's not like you're following a regulation about dumping it in a stream. Again, situational. The, the technology can treat it to potable quality standards. Um, and we can, we can meter that depending on what the customer needs. So, for example, the, 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 the first instance is you go into a, an industrial setting and the, the industrial owner has two challenges, many challenges, but two relating to water. One is ensuring water security. Water is a key input. It's, 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 a, it's a raw material into their process, whether you're producing power or automobiles. The other issue they have is now they deal with that waste stream. So the first value prop that we have is we can take your waste stream, clean it up, and, 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 and allow it to be reused. So they, each of them has a different level of quality it needs to be treated. The technology can be tuned. It can be cleaner than the stuff that comes out of your tap, or it can be has a little bit more, depending on what they need. Now, the next wave will be an industrial owner who doesn't need all that water, but who either wants to discharge it or discharge it beneficially. And, and maybe, maybe there's an agricultural client next to them, and they can sell that water to them. They're, depending on the regulation and what's happening, you have to manage the cleanliness of it. So again, that comes to her, her earlier questions. It really kind of depends, but the, the, the technology can be, the technology can do all sorts of things. It depends on what you want to spend. Well, so it could end up in a municipal could. use. Could. So you could link it to you could. public it's use of water. Certainly from a right? quality, and, and occasionally for show, I will drink the water. Um, societally, people have to get their heads wrapped around, I'm going to drink water that came out of a fracking well, or I'm going to drink water that used to be my toilet water. So Israel and Singapore have done a good job of coming up that reuse curve. They're in the 80, 90 percent range. Every place else, including the U.S., is low teen, single digit reuse. So we're, we're kind of a once and done society, so we've got to recycle stuff. And, and it's, it's, it's people getting comfortable, it's regulations, enabling that to the right pricing mechanisms, and, and it's also risk management between these, these value chains that, that are separate. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. I have a follow up question from years. I want to know what kind of uh, draw solution do you use? Can, I, can we take that offline? Why don't we take the technical question offline? It's, it's, a, it's an ammonia, the, the primary one is a thermolytic draw solution, ammonia based thermolytic draw solution. So we can share a bit more off offline. I didn't want to get too much in the technology, okay? Yes. Yeah, quick question um, about the regulation piece. So in thinking about corporations as these sort of sociopathic entities that respond to regulatory pressure, yeah. I'm wondering if um, lobbying or something to that uh, effect plays into the business model. Yeah, so regulation. So let's abstract it and say, how do you deal with regulation? So regulation is a big driver. So it's, what's, it's, it's the big driver that drove us to China. It's India. You'd like to think that folks will do the right thing. Some do, some don't. Some companies do the right thing. Many don't until they're forced. So regulation matters a lot. So the first thing we do is make sure we understand regulation. 
Um, and a lot, a lot of that's uh, our partner locally understanding what's happening in China, India, and the U.S. We spend a lot of time understanding the regs, reading things. The next, the next the longer term cycle is influencing regulation. You first got to understand it, then you got to sort of imagine where it could go in the risks. It could become better for you, it could become worse for you, so you got to understand that. And then you got to try to invest time and resource to at least inform regulators. And, and in that case, it's complex, because in, in the U.S. there's some 46,000 regulatory bodies that govern water. And so who do you go? Do I go to the mayor? Do I go to the county? Do I go to the governor's office? Do I go down to EPA? Which region do I go to? So you've got to sort of figure out what, who owns that problem set. In Israel and, and in Singapore, much easier. You've got one, one body, which is why they've been able to do more work. Regulation matters a lot. Um, we are now coming into the phase, as we move into 16, 17, this growth phase, we're, we're going to invest some of our resource in being more proactive in regulation. So part of it is me. I've done regulatory work in other areas. So I you know, use the, my EPA relationships and try to guide what's happening. Um, but we're going to start to become more aggressive. But that's a long cycle investment. And you should, you should not make a bet that regulation, even as an investor or as an entrepreneur, that regulation is going to change in your favor. Because more often than not, it does not, and it takes a long time. I, uh, I don't want to distract you too much from the trajectory I, you were on. But I am, I'm not sure I'm on a trajectory. It's Right. So you mentioned that during the first couple of weeks that you were CEO at Oasis, you had to figure out what was the industry, what was the geography that you wanted to, yeah. to target. Yeah. I was hoping you could elaborate a little bit on how you identified immediately what was going to, you know, what was going to be the first industry or what was going to be the first geography that you were going to go after. Yeah. So the, the, the first box was easier because it wasn't which one we were going to go after. It was all the things we were going to say no to. So box one was an ex exclusionary box. And it was a really tough decision was seawater desalination. Because that kept, we kept waffling like, oh, do we want to be seawater desal industrial? So we finally said, you know what? We are going to focus on industrial waters. We didn't even really know what that fully meant. We'd done a little bit of work in oil and gas. So we essentially said, you know what, that's out. And there was, we just sort of looked at all the things we knew about, things, and, and, and a lot of it was, was at that time, it was more about activities. Like all the stuff we're spending time on. We're, you know, we're, we're talking to that person. We're doing this. We're, he's, let's just no. No to 90% of the stuff. And, 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 it's, and that's the classic sort of thing about strategy. It's not what you do as much as what you don't do. So the first box was, was hard but, but relatively easier than the next box, which was your question, what do you really do? And, and so we, we really did two things. We did oil and gas in the US because We'd done pilot work. It was we could access it because it was in our you know not in our backyard but close enough, and we thought we had some differentiated capability. We hadn't fully proved it, but we felt, and, and it was also at that time hydraulic fracture was going crazy. So it's like whoa, geez, it's a no-brainer. Um, it's come down. We still think oil and gas is a good market. And then the second thing we did was I we looked and said you know oil and that's just too single-threaded. So we said what is one other thing we could put on our plate, and you know thought about it. I'd done other things in China. And so I had been agitating from the board about China. And then when I came in, I said, well, OK, it's my sort of not my problem. So we, we did some work and said, let's go to China. Didn't even know what that meant. Um, we, know, we know a lot more what it means now. And that was the right move, because if we had only focused on oil and gas in the US, I might be here, but I'd be doing something different. I wouldn't be talking about Oasis right now. Can I add something? Of course, yeah. I mean, uh, if you go to a municipal seawater, let's see. Yeah. You got to hold it down, Manny. If you go to a municipal uh, seawater desalination, the competing technology is reverse osmosis technology, and it's very, very close to what we call the thermodynamic limit of the energy. So it's so, so good. And the only way that uh, Oasis uh, process would compete if you will have abundance of waste heat. But many times, it's not easy to get w the waste heat. Now, on the other hand, reverse osmosis technology cannot desalinate water with very, very high salinity. And this is where forward osmosis can do it very well. So this is why they went to this area. what he wants to do. Yeah. Hey, so many, just looking at time, we have two options. Um, well, three options. One, the last segment I was going to talk, I'll answer some more questions, which I'd rather do more than anything. Um, but if, if we go back to the trajectory, <laughs> as, such as it is, I was going to talk a little bit about just how we think about being a CEO, if that's interesting. Or we could jump right to your questions um, as well. So what, what would you, do you have a preference? Uh, the CEO would be great for the 
Uh, okay. So, but the, your, your questions. <laughs> but but what's important is is the relationship, be, you know, the, the roots to Yale and the relationship to the to the technical roots and the company and, ke and keeping that connectivity. It's not always easy. But you got many who's a world leader in the area, bouncing around, thinking about new stuff. So uh, it, what you got to be careful of is not not being t too technically focused because you got to think about growing an enterprise. On the other hand, as you get bigger, you can't forget your technical roots because you always got to think about what's happening in the sector. So it is important to understand the relationship between technology roots and founding and the company and, and, and the energetic of all that. But other, other questions before I kind of go, yes? So before you decided to go into China, have you done any studies or it's really just you d decided to just go for it? Um, it wasn't quite that blasé. Um, I sort of characterized it as that. Well, number one, so we knew it's a big market. We knew that they had gone through 20 years of industrialization and that as bad as the air pollution problem is, the water pollution problem was, was as bad or worse. So we knew there was a big problem. We knew that we'd done our work. We knew that there was some regulatory drivers that were going to force industrial owners and operators to think differently about water treatment. We knew that the water, the water qualities were going to be good fits for what we thought we could be differentiated in providing. Um, we, we knew that, that a lot of Chinese, some, some Chinese customers would be early adopters. They liked Western technology. Um, and so there was, there was an, a, a willingness to take a risk on a new technology. And most importantly, I, through a relationship I had, I had a, 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 a potential, and it turned out to be a trusted partner, a Chinese partner, who could bring us to that market. So that's a lot of things that line up. So it wasn't, so, but in, it's, it's much clearer in retrospect to articulate those things, but we did all that work and said, at some point you say, Let's go and let's figure out there's a, a deal to be done there. We did a deal with our Chinese partner and we sold our first system. We got commissioned our first system. We have a pipeline. So all, and then we've learned, I could talk for the rest of the, the week about all the things um, that we've learned about how to, how to become an operational company, but especially operating in China with our partner. We've learned a lot together. So that was kind of how we made the decision. And then for two years, we focused on 18 months, two years, we focused on those first two commitments. So the box became even tighter. And we said no to lots and lots of stuff. Um, once, once I felt like we were far enough along, still not done yet, in oil and gas and in China, we started say, opening our aperture. And, and I think you go through periods of divergence, explore what's happening, converge, make decisions, and execute. You know, you're constantly doing that cycle. So we went back through a divergent phase. And, and we had a lot of in, inbound interest from India. We knew Middle East, of course, had its own issues. So we studied those, figured out how do we go there. We're now executing in those two regions, converging again to execute and, and you know, stressing, stressing, really stressing the organization. And right to the point of, of many days of, you know, of, of breaking, right? Because you got to push it. We, I, I have a bunch of Navy SEAL friends, and my nephew's going through that training now, but they, they have an adage in Navy SEAL land, which is the only easy day was yesterday. So we saw the end of the story we talking about it at Oasis. The only easy day was yesterday. It's not quite that bad, but I mean, so you got to keep pushing, right? You got to keep pushing, or we're not going to achieve our mission. A question on the economics of your product as you describe it to your customers. Yeah. I would imagine that since it's um, energy intensive, new technology, does a lot of work for the client. Um, you're not really selling it as something that has a cost benefit or payback period or an investment for the company. This is a, these are, your clients need a water technology to meet regulations yep. or to get water where there's not enough water to meet their needs of intake, right? So um, this is just like, it's a cost no, so for them. Y y the second half, yes. The first half, no. You still got to sell an economic proposition. So you, you look at the competitive landscape. The, the number one competitor is non consumption, people not doing anything. And so you got to understand, if they're not going to do anything, it's not a good use of your time. You then find customers who either want to or need to do something. And now once you're in that zone, it's all about are you the best something? So you're absolutely competing competitively. And, and for us, once we got clear that we're not competing against RO, that we're compatible with reverse osmosis, then we said, who are we competing with? Well, primarily, we're competing with thermal mechanical evaporative systems. It could be you know, old school evaporative ponds. Um, but usually it's you know, big pots and pans, heat exchangers that, that boil the water. And, and there, we've done a lot of work and we can articulate very clearly that we have a significant net present value advantage in capital costs lower 
and lower operating costs, lower energy costs. So there you have to go in and, and absolutely, we're selling against GE, with all respect to our hosts um, here tonight. Lo great, fabulous company, but we compete against GE. So we compete against other multinational companies, little old Oasis going and saying, hey, we've got this thing, it's better. And, and the most important thing for us in the last two years has been to get our first systems up and operational so that people trust what we're doing and be able to show the data. And now as we've done that, it hasn't been easy to now be able to take those case studies and that should, should, should uh, compress the sales cycle and get more and more systems. So that's been a huge focus for us. So it absolutely is about economics. Now, can you show an ROI on water? And you can do that in oil and gas. You gotta show that and it's very situational back to your first question. But economics matter a ton. They're not doing this because it's making them feel good. when it comes to water, especially water technologies that have an added plug load, right, that have added energy, yeah. it starts to make the costs look hard Again, to so it's, 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 it's comparing, um, comparing our energy to evaporators is the key. We can show that we're 25% less energy, and, and actually we think a bit better even, um, to, to what we've seen in, this, in, in the field. Yes? Uh, so, mentioned this to you a little bit earlier, but taking a corporate water risk strategy course, and we're talking a lot about how some of the early movers, early adopters of corporate water strategies have been companies who really care about reputational risk. Yes. Um, Coca-Cola in northern India. Looking at where your company is right now, also my experience with China, thinking about China and state-owned enterprises, I'm assuming the political implications of polluting out of a factory, out of high-intensity industries, were probably also a driver in your cell. Um, if yep. that's accurate in any way um, or not, uh, curious to hear more about that and also how that, as you plan to grow the company, uh, how political risk and reputational risk of water management factors in. Yes. So um, imagine a triangle. This gets to the last two questions. And, and, and the bottom left point is cost to source water. So you need water on the input. Bottom right is the cost to treat or to discharge. So that, that's, an, that's a purely economic, I pay X to source. I pay Y to get rid of. If you can sell me something that is less than X plus Y, that's good. There's an economic reuse argument. And in some cases, in oil and gas, we were getting to that place where the economic, that made sense in some places. Now you add the third, the top of the triangle is what we call stakeholder value. Could be brand. So there are absolutely companies that are brand sensitive, either because they're, the owners or the investors, it may be privately held may have activist investors, they may, have a, they may be brand sensitive to their consumers, um, and so that drives them to be out in front of the regulatory curve. Could be just enlightened leadership that says, man, I gotta manage this, because it ain't here today, but it's coming, and I gotta make these investments. And then there are just, boom, the regulatory hammer comes down, and you gotta do something different. I would say that right now, most places who are gonna buy what we're doing is, is item number three, but we're, we're working, we're working with folks that are in bucket one and two to be on front of that, and there absolutely are good examples of that. And there, there are examples of that in, in everywhere. There's, there are examples of companies like that in China and India who want to be out in front of stuff, even though there's regulation. There are companies in the U.S. that don't care; that are waiting for the big regulatory hammer to come down. So it really, it really depends. But it's and that's true of sustainability generally, not just water. But that that same triangle works when you think about it. It's sustainable economics. We call that the economic envelope. Okay. How are we doing? Okay. So let me, let me just wrap up for, for those of you that think um, about, uh, you know, about leadership and want to be a business leader or think about wanting to be a CEO. Let me just sort of a few reflections on that. First, I don't know why, but I, I was kind of putting this together on the train ride here, which probably is obvious. But um, I was looking at the, the word, you know when you type a word sometimes and it just looks weird to you? And I was typing the word chief, and I was like, I said, I before E, or well, how the heck do you spell it? Because it just, usually it's CEO. And I put chief. And I was like, chief. So I went, I went and said, yeah, what is chief? What does it mean? And this is what came up. So um, highest in rank or authority, and most important. And I, this struck me because the first one, yeah, at the end of the day, you are the highest rank, and the buck stops with you, but the, absolutely, not the most important person in the company. And, you, and if you ever want to be that, you, you, you got to be really clear. If you want to be the CEO because you want to be the most important person, you got that backwards and you should go do something else. So I thought that was quite interesting. Um, 
the thing about leadership is you're, you're part tactician. You've got to really deeply understand strategy, tactics, how that all works. And I had a question in one of the earlier sessions about you're a military guy. Like, what, what did you learn? And I seek that ability to think strategically and tactically and connect the two matters a whole bunch. Um, there are great CEOs who are just st you know, strategicians, some great operators. I think, you, you know, I've tried to be both and you can build a team around your weaknesses. You also got to be an innovator. You got to think differently about everything you do. And then I think in, in, in both of them, the micro inside your organization, but especially in sustainability, you need to be a diplomat. You got to, you got to understand the way the world works. There's a lot of policy and there's a lot of leadership is about understanding the organizational dynamics. So you got to kind of have all, all that going for you. So being a chief executive officer, we also laugh is that, be, that the C in CEO is current, meaning that you're the current executive officer, which means that you got to do your job or you're going to have another executive officer who's going to be the CEO. And it's true. At the end of the day, I mean, it's about results, right? If you're leading an organization, you got to get results. So first you're the chief communicator. Um, communication, I mean, it, I, you've all taken a lot of these organizational behavior stuff and it, it, you cannot over communicate about communication. Communicating to your board, communicating to your customers, communicating internally about the big things and the little things. How transparent are you going to be or not? You got to make those decisions. But communication is huge. Email, in person, small meetings. Do I call somebody? Do I go there? I mean, the communication is so huge. And it means I spend most of my time thinking about communication. You're also the chief, at least the way we play it, chief hire and fire. It doesn't mean you make every hiring decision, but the human capital strategy, your talent strategy, you got to define what you're about as a company. You got to have your, your value system. We talk about, we hire for two things, for functional competence and value fit. Like you could have the person who's the best scientist in the world, but they're not a value fit. They don't, they're not going to map culturally. It doesn't work. So I'm primarily the sort of the cultural filter at this. And I, I mean, we're only 60 folks, but it's going to be a long time until I don't interview everybody, final candidates, to make sure that, that, that they really are the right fit. And then also you got you to really push the organization about when, when to make a decision, when the relationship with an employee is, is over. I don't mean that in a bad way. Sometimes employees outlive organizations. Sometimes organizations outlive the, the teammates, including CEOs. But having a really open, candid dialogue, we do professional development. So we have a program so nobody's surprised in that. So we spend a lot of time thinking about our team, our values, hiring, and, and evolving the organization. You know, you can hire a strategy officer or a chief commercial officer. I think at the end of the day, as the CEO, you own, the thing you own is you own the strategy and you own, um, you own the team. Those are the big things that you own. So you gotta think a lot about strategy, but you've also gotta find how you get good inputs for the rest of your team and synthesize and then communicate your strategy. Um, early stage especially, there's no substitute for the CEO. It doesn't mean I'm the best salesperson. It doesn't mean I, I'm a professional salesperson. But what it means is when we're going to go close a deal at this stage and you're going to get another company or a customer to believe in Oasis, they want to see me there. They want to look me in the eye. And I've got to make a commitment to that we're going to do what it takes to make this work. So you know, if, if you're going to be in the front office, you're going to get called into the big meetings. It also means you are a big part of an early stage company when you're not profitable yet is you got to go raise money. You got to tell the story. Um, you better like the story, you better figure it out because you're going to tell it every single day. You're going to tell it to everybody. You're going to sell people to join your company as employees. You're going to sell partners. You're going to go sell investors so that they believe in you. So you, I mean, it's all thinking about fundraising nonstop when you're at the stage and it's not easy in this sector. Also chief negotiator, right? Because you've got to, you got to think about how do you make these trade-offs? You're doing a deal. It was a nine-month negotiation with our Chinese partner. And that was like, I can tell you, was not easy. And there were days I was like, I can't get out of bed today. I can't negotiate anymore. Um, but you got to think about that. So you gotta, you, you got to work that. you got to find that. And you got to be the chief cheerleader. Um, and, and that means sometimes you got to give a yay boo, right? You gets like, today we're doing great. We got to go when people are down. And sometimes it means you've got to say, folks, we're not doing a good job. We are not doing what we need to do and, and find a way to mobilize the organization. But at the end of the day, you got to stay, this is my view, you got to stay steady. You got to stay positive. You got to take a deep breath because you're going to get a lot of bad news. And if you, when you get bad news, from an employee, you have two choices. You can take a deep breath, say, many thank you for that. It's very interesting. We're going to figure that out. Or many can come to me and say, 
hey, I've got this problem with the membrane. You can go, Manny, oh my God, right? And that's the last time Manny's probably going to come and tell you anything. So you've got to think about how you, how you keep folks focused. And you also cheap bottle washer. What that means is that I think any organization, but you know, you're never to, we have, we have kitchens, right? In our, and if you use a dish, you clean it. If you go to the, the kitchen and there's dirty dishes, somebody should have cleaned it, you clean it. Right? You do the little things because it's setting that example for the rest of your team. You expect someone to do the little work for you or you leave your conference room dirty. It drives me crazy. We're trying to get everybody to clean their conference rooms right after their meetings. It's setting the example. It's the little things. And you can be a great strategist, but if you don't communicate, if you're a great strategist, but if you don't set the example, you know, people are not going to line up behind you. So the, I mean, your chief many things, your chief executive officer, we get all these tasks um, that you gotta, you got to accomplish. I'm sure there's many that I missed, but I just was thinking about the, the final ones. Okay, so back to this. So what, what do people re respond to this? What have you thought about a little bit? Any reactions to this list? Yeah. Right on. These are all false, false choices. I believe they're all false choices. Yeah, sequencing. You and I talked about that earlier, right? Yeah, that's right. So these are all it, these are all false choices. You may not be the boss, you may not be the CEO, but you better be a leader. Um, you may work at a big company, but you better figure out how to innovate. You better be an entrepreneur. Or you're not going to be particularly valuable, and your company is not going to do well. Focus in the U.S. Forget about it. It's a global world. Making money, making a difference. We talked about that. Doesn't mean you have to make money to make a difference, but you could find ways to make money in sustainability, investing in it, starting companies. You can do that. Or you could do that in sequence. Look what Mark Zuckerberg and his wife are doing. This, the one I struggled with the most was just be great at something or having balance because you know, it, it takes time to be great at something, but you, you, you can do that over time. And I do believe that you're a better leader if you can find balance. And that's a really tough one I struggle with for sure. Do important work or have fun. I, I think if you're, if you're going from your, your purpose and your passion, it's, it's, it's going to be fun in different ways. It may not always be ha-ha fun, but it, you're going to be you're gonna out of bed and you're going to be motivated. Um, and this idea of get to work or be a student, you've got to keep learning. I mean, whether you're here or you're in, in a company, you've got to always be, whether you're on the technical side or the business side, business, just like engineering, is an avocation. You've got to keep learning. You've got to try stuff. You've got to make mistakes. You've got to read books. I mean, you're constantly learning. You've got to be curious. Um, and, and, and so I came back to this, which is the only three constants, I think, for you all over the next 25 or 50 years in your careers is going to be leadership, innovation, and sustainability. These are the things that, that, that are going to drive the world. You need leaders. It's, innovation is relentless. You've got to do it. And innovation is, is solving problems, not just ideas. It's making stuff happen. And sustainability, whether you want to be in clean tech, you want to be in water, you want to be in automobile manufacturing or investment, banking. Sustainability is going to drive the next 25 to 50 years. So these are the constants. These are the things you've got to figure out. That's what I got for you. Other questions? I have one question. So um, do you think that the, most of the, it seems that most of the uh, young technology companies or the high tech companies, usually the CEO is like um, start as the um, co-founder or the, um, I don't know, the technician or something yes. like that. So do you think that it's better for a high tech company to have a CEO that is an engineer or it actually doesn't matter? It's better to, for me to go to a um, management school if mm -hmm. I want to make a difference or if it's better yeah. to move yeah. for me to learn engineering? What's your goal? You want to be, you want to start a company? You want to run a company? You first got to get clear where you want to go. I, I guess I'm figuring that out along the way, you know what I mean? Sure, as am I. Yeah, I I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up. Um, so you say, so you, you made a generalization, which I, I'm going to disagree with, is that most CEOs are technical founders. Very few technical founders, even te technical founding CEOs, are CEOs after two or three or five years. Fabulous, you know, Bill Gates. Mark Zuckerberg, handful of folks have done that and miraculously and, and to the scale they've gotten. You know, having been on both sides of it, teams go through phases. You have a, and, and, and very few CEOs scale with that. And part of that is because 
there's, there's paradigms. People say you gotta have a technical person, you gotta have a business person. But a lot of it, the, the amazing thing about Zuckerberg is that he has, there's some great stories about what he's invested in himself to, to grow into that. He surrounded himself with people, um, and, and the company's been fabulously successful, right? But he's grown, he's invested a lot in growing through that. Um, and so I would say that any, any starting point, one can become a successful CEO, but the biggest issue is you've gotta know your weaknesses, you've gotta hire around yourself, you've gotta to continue to learn and evolve. Um, and if you're the chief, if you're the, if you're the CTO and the CEO, pick one, right? Because if you're gonna be the guy who's in the center of the technical enterprise, and you're trying to be the CEO, nothing about what I said, I'm a, I, I mean, I know technology, I'm an engineer, but I'm not the technologist, so I, I was not the chief technology, I wasn't one of my C's, right? I defer that to other people. And I, and I think that it's really tough to be the CEO and, 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 and be heads down in the technology all the time because you're not gonna scale the organization. So you gotta pick one or another as you go on. There's nobody, nobody that I know who's CEO and CTO after a couple of years. They kind of go one direction or another. And oh, by the way, that's fine. Right, if you start a company and you're the CEO and CTO, and in two years you get some funding, you go, hmm, I think I'm the right guy, and you get the right advice. It says you could be the CEO. Hire somebody to own the tech enterprise. Intimately work with them, but do the CEO job. Or in two years you say, you know what? I'm not ready to be a CEO. I'm gonna hire a great CEO, someone who I can trust and partner with. I'm gonna own the technical enterprise, and I can, you can, doesn't mean you can't be an outside guy and do stuff. Does that answer your question? You don't seem satisfied with that answer. No, 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 I guess, I guess. Okay, okay. All right, All right we probably got to wrap. Okay, thank you for having me, it's good to be here. <laughs>